Is that better? Yeah. Okay. You have the other room turned. You have the other room turned off. All right. Sorry, technical difficulties. If y'all didn't get one already, there's a nice, colorful map that I did not come up with, but I found it online. So the nice thing about maps that I can appreciate, especially when we're studying through this chapter and the next chapter, Acts 27 and Acts 28, um, when we talk about Paul being uh, basically transported by ship, um, you can appreciate some of the verbiage when we talk about some of the weather patterns, you can talk about some of the, uh, the shelter that they found in different locations. So that's, that's kind of the basis of just why I wanted to have the map. I would have a large screen right here, but we don't have a camera up there or projector up there anymore. So you have a nice handheld version for you. So if you remember just uh, leading up to chapter 27, we had, um, remember Paul is, is in Caesarea, undergoing uh, different trials or basically uh, situations where he's having to, having to defend himself uh, among Felix and then the Festus. And then uh, last week in chapter 26, we talked about with King Agrippa and Bernice, uh, basically to hear him out because he had appealed to Caesar, which was his right as a Roman citizen, but they needed accurate. It is some kind of verifiable charges to be able to send him on to, and that's kind of where we led up to. In his dealing, we talked about this last week when, when Gunnar was teaching, but one of the things we keep on coming back to with Paul and his example as far as, as a teacher, as a minister, as a person that has undergone uh, a lot of uh, jail time, a lot of uh, you know, beatings, endured a lot for the sake of Christ, I'll, I'll put it that way, that we see this great example that continues to, to flourish, continues to keep on keeping on. And one of the things in his discussion at the end of chapter 26, uh, one of my favorite verses, at least thinking about it as far as Paul's influence, Paul's teaching, even with him, with him defending himself, you know, Agrippa said, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. And then Paul kind of continued. He kind of answered that and then said in verse 29, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and together such as I am, except for the chains that he was wearing. So he had influence, he had desire, and his desire was to teach the gospel to all those around him. And so, leading into chapter 27, um, we sit there, we talk about he's gone through these different trials, different situations of him defending himself, and we get into chapter 27 where he's going to be the, the start of the trip, basically, for him to go from Caesarea to Rome, and that's kind of um, why I kind of presented or had the map for you. So we'll look at verses 1 through 8 together to start out with, and we'll kind of discuss different sections as we go. There's some very interesting things I'm going to pull out of this that the, the writer, uh, Luke, a lot of times we sit there and think about it, a lot of times we might overlook these things, but yet uh, I believe in just my research and this study, I enjoy sometimes looking at some of those details and learning from those things. And so I'll read through verses 1 through 8, and we'll kind of discuss those. It says, And when it was decided that we should set sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So entering a ship of uh, Adoramitium, we put to sea, meaning to, set, uh, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. And the next day we landed at Sidon. And Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. When we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over to the sea, which is off of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. When we had sailed slowly many days and arrived with difficulty off Snidus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete, off of Samon, passing it with difficulty. We came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lycia. So here we see, again, we see Paul, we see, as far as the writer, we see Luke 
is traveling here and says, you know, in verse, we see Paul, he says, here, we, along with other prisoners, were traveling under the guard. Uh, with Julius, who was a centurion or such guard. We see also mentioned Aristarchus, Macedonian, and Thessalonica in verse 2. This Roman centurion mission, mentioned by name, and we'll see this word used again throughout the chapter. Um, this Julius, we see um, you know, some kindness already shown, but um, there's some commentators think maybe he is probably the same centurion who is helpful throughout this trip. We, you know, we don't know that for sure, but it, 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 as we study throughout the chapter, it seems like um, this person is helping to look after Paul's uh, situation or Paul's condition. This uh, the ship of uh, Adoridium uh, basically just means where it was from or uh, belonging to that area. It was a port in uh, Mysia or in Asia Minor. That's basically some of those details we talk about um, we, as I mentioned, we see, verse 3, see some of the characteristics of Julius. Uh, treated Paul kindly, gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. This could have been care, um, you know, able to just be care given to be able to go see his friends or perhaps care for any things he was perhaps dealing with, some of his maybe physical issues or physical things he was, had endured. Um, as I mentioned, look at the map, sailing under the shelter of Cyprus because this is verse four says the winds were contrary. When, I th- when we think there, think about um, impact of winds, impact of, of sea, of waves and things that um, we'll talk here a few minutes about what time of year this was and, and just the different types of, of things they went through traveling. But yet, um, definitely the wind was going to play a big impact in this trip. And so, you know, we will have, and I'll refer to this a little later, but we have different areas that we can talk about different impacts of wind and the waves um, that we'll talk about here in, in a few minutes. So they sailed and landed in, in Myra. Um, then see the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, basically another option, another, perhaps the one they were sailing on wasn't direct, headed directly there and put us on board, perhaps the quickest way to get Paul and maybe other prisoners from there to Rome. The description of this ship uh, that he's going to, that he's just boarded, um, as we dis- see more descriptions uh, within the chapter, is this is one of the largest, basically described as one of the largest ships that there were. Described because it held, it hauled like grain or wheat, we'll, we'll learn about that. But one of the largest ships available to travel in. So you would think large, protected, uh, built really well. And we'll, we'll sit there and we'll read through these things and, and kind of talk, see what's affected by this. But just remember some of these things as we're going through. Verse 7 and 8, I kind of found interesting. It said they sailed slowly many days. So we think about power of wind. We think the power of the water. We also think that there's not propulsion moving these ships. It's wind-driven, everything by sail. And so if the winds aren't working with you, if the currents aren't working with you, things are not going to move very quickly. So he says, Luke says, we sailed slowly many days, arrived with difficulty. You see the wind not permitting us to proceed. Sailed into the shelter, passing it with difficulty. And it's interesting when you sit there and, and um, think about even just looking through the study of chapter 27. Just the word itself, without any other thing, looking at the word difficult or difficulty is used three times in this chapter of just based on their travel. So, it, you know, it's kind of a thing that they're, they're having to endure. Things that they're going to encounter, it's not an easy trip. And, you know, Paul's not in control. He's, he's just a prisoner on board, but yet he and Luke and others are observing these things that they're having to endure. Verses 9 through 12. Now, when much uh, time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded than the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, opening toward the southwest and northwest and winter there. Um, we see uh, the, the concern. We see Paul's concern of the travel. Basically because um, we see kind of a, 
basically description about the time uh, in parent reference to the fasting the, during the Day of Atonement. This would have been around uh, October time frame. So what, or even around here, what happens a lot of times during the month of October, we see hurricane season, we see things t that impact even the weather patterns here, but it also impacts other areas. Uh, traveling at that time by ship was dangerous. And so that, that had some of Paul's concern um, that we see take place here. We see that, that initially, even though the centurion who was kind of looking out for Paul's uh, interest in getting him to Rome, we see that he was more persuaded by those on the ship than what Paul's warning was. So he said, no, we're going to keep on going. We're going to go ahead and do this. Um, interesting thing, is it mentions that where they were at in Fair Havens, that it was not, there wasn't a harbor there. Basically, they wanted to proceed over to Phoenix, which was a little further on the southwest side, because at, at, Phoenix, or at Fair Havens, there was not a safe harbor there. Um, at Fair Havens, basically what happens, the harbor is basically formed by gradually curving shoreline that runs east and southwest. It did not shelter ships from wind in every direction. The harbor shape <coughs> sheltered ships from the northwestern wind, but other, <coughs> excuse me, few offshore inlets. It was unprotected from the sea. And so that's, that was kind of details you can see, see from the map kind of where they were located at and basically the protection that they needed from the wind, especially in the situation they were in. Um, looking to, on to verse 13 through 20, this is, this is another interesting thing that we'll, we'll read about. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. But not long, not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose, called a Eurocliton. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Claudia, or Clauda, we secured the skiff with difficulty. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship, and fearing lest they should run aground on the Sirtis sands, they struck sail and so were driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day, they threw, <clears throat> they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. And when neither the sun nor stars appeared for many days, no small tempest beat on us, and all hope we would be saved was finally given up. <clears throat> So here again, they're, they're thinking the winds have calm, calmed enough to make that transition from Fair Havens around under that southern edge, the southern or southwest edge to Phoenix. It says they sailed close to the island there. <coughs> it says not long after they had left. They said the winds had calmed down. Basically, it said not soon after they had left, what happened? It said a tempestuous headwind arose uh, called a Eurocliden. Basically, it's described as a violent, tempestuous storm. Um, it's just, it, it's very, uh, you know, basically it was described like by Luke, but yet it's a very strong wind, a lot, uh, lot of issue, a lot of danger. And so they, they, again, they ignored Paul's warning that he had talked about in verse 10. You know, he thinks this is going to end in disaster. So... You know, there might have been a, I told you so, there might have been a thing like that, but yet, um, you know, it's interesting that with a direction, and I've never, I've never sailed on a sailboat, so I'm not familiar with um, how you would transverse through different areas when you have one main sail and the wind's pointing in a different direction. Most modern things basically have some kind of propulsion or some kind of motor on the back that if your wind's not working with you, you can still get to some area. But during this time, that didn't take place. So it says, we could not head into the wind, so we let her drive. Basically, they're letting the ship get taken wherever the, the wind's going to take them to go. They, they didn't have control over it. And so that kind of puts you in a helpless position because they have a goal in mind to get somewhere, and they're not able to direct the ship. So it's just an interesting thing. The interesting thing, um, I just did a quick study. Um, we don't have a lot of study or a lot of details back in this time. But think about, you know, they already knew it was a dangerous time to be out sailing around based, based on the time of year. 
And I look back just to see how much more safer and how much things take place because our ship traffic doesn't stop this time of year because of storms. And sometimes they get deterred, but yet, you know, perhaps they have safer routes they travel. An interesting thing in 2000, the year 2000, so this is a long time since when this took place. In the year 2000, a uh, record 200 ships were lost to capsizing because of storms. In 2010, only 100 ships. <clears throat> in 2021, only 49 ships. So you can see, you know, basically as things have taken place, uh, just as a weird comparison that you could think about, again, the, the ship they were on was a very large ship, one of the larger ships that was during this time because of what they were carrying. And so this is an interesting thing to think about just how things have come about since then. Hey, yes. Uh, one comment that, I, that made, stood out to me was they know that, that Paul is a monotheist who believes in the one true God, and, and Rome has this pantheon of gods. And um, I, I know that they have a god for like the wind and the sea that they were probably praying to, yet they have Paul here basically like correcting them and telling them, you know, that it's going to be hard times. And they, they probably, you know, thought, no, we have our gods who's watching out for Rome or watching out for us. And it's kind of like, I wonder if there's an undertone of like what happened in Egypt where everything that, all those plagues were like an offense to the Egyptian gods and, and maybe something like that. Yeah, the interesting at thing. Least, at least we yeah. know like whenever they're in a tough time that they'll be praying to a particular yeah, it's interesting because we don't come across any of that detail right. given to us. Right. But the one thing you, we are given is that, and you can put ourselves in that same position, if you are the captain of a ship and you have a trained crew with you and you're hauling a whole load of grain, corn, whatever you're, or wheat, whatever you're taking from one place to another, and you're experienced to do that, uh, even with adverse weather, you've probably made that trip before. And you're, you take aboard 200 plus prisoners, or 200 basically total crew, 276 will get there eventually, um, to transport. And one of them sits there and tells you, we're not going to make it. So then it's up, you know, basically our experienced crew versus this one person. That's kind of what, how I see it is that, okay, we, we get what you're saying, but we've done this before or we've done this. And so that's kind of how I see that they're, they're relying on their experience. They're relying on their trust in themselves and their equipment rather than a prisoner. Mm -hmm. And so they weren't giving him a lot of basically, uh, basically power in what his thoughts were, his fear was. I mean, there could be lots of prisoners like, well, they don't have anything better. You know, they're not looking forward to going to prison or already being in prison. So, you know, who, who cares if it ends in shipwreck or whatever? But, you know, Paul is at least had a concern that he mentioned on. So no, that's, that's good thinking, a good thought. The interesting thing, um, we talk about this, um, this passage. We run across at the, in verse 17, the description um, said they, were, they would fear uh, well, first of all, the island that they were g going around this is very small. This island, um, which is now called uh, Gabdos, G-A-V-D-O-S, which is now th at that time was Cauda uh, or Clauda. This was a very, very small island. It actually measures seven miles long by three miles deep. So very small, very small. Um, not much protection for a large boat in a storm. And it mentions having to secure the lifeboat with difficulty. Mentions, uh, you know, they were driven basically where the, wherever the wind would take them. They had to use additional cables to further support the ship, fearing they would run aground on the Sirtis sands. The, the interesting thing, I did some research on this, and I have a, probably two or three pages. I don't have time to go through all those. But I pulled little bits and pieces of information about this because, like, well, fearing they would run aground on sand. You'd think, okay. I've been in a boat before and you're traveling and maybe you get in an area where it's a little too shallow and you start like rubbing bottom. 
And then you're thinking, oh, we're going to get stuck out here. And then you're able to you know, do something, move around, and you're able to get out. But this was a large ship, large ship carrying lots of cargo, lots of people. And basically, the, there's an interesting thing I want, kind of want to point out. There's a long history of ancient accounts that give descriptions of the Surtis Sands. One description of the sands is, uh, basically goes back even bef- uh, into the B.C. Uh, time frame. But basically, it's described as an area where ships become stranded, where there's no getting them out again. Once they're forced to enter that gulf, from everywhere uh, waters are shallows, everywhere thickets of seaweed from the depths, and, and they overcome them, silently washing the foam uh, through the water. So basically it sneaks up on you. And this, this area is, is a large area. Uh, and so it was, it was impacted lots of vessels. And so the experienced crew would have been familiar with this. Even those who maybe not experienced knew about this area. Um, another person described it as two bodies of water that um, basically the, the water, deep waters contain, there's areas of deep waters that contain shallows. And the result is at the ebb and flow of the tides that sailors sometimes fall into the shallows and stick there and that the safe escape of a boat is rare. So it's interesting thinking about that, thinking about what they were fearing. Um, Cross cross currents, long sandbars, extending a great distance out into the sea. One of the most interesting things, and I don't know if y'all are familiar with Canyon Lake, one of the lakes that's closest to here. when it was built back by the Corps of Engineers, I don't remember exactly what year, but you go back and if you're ever out in the boat, and the boat in the lake, of course, it's low, but it can be level full. And you can be 100 yards off the shore going around one of the points, and you get there and all of a sudden your outboard motor, boom, pops up and down because it hits something, and you're 100 yards from shore because there's stuff hidden under the water. Also, in, it, sometimes when the water is low, you can see that there were frames of houses that were just covered up by when they built the dam and started to uh, close it up. There were houses that were still along the sides. So I've seen those like cinder block walls. And so there's danger sometimes lurking under the water. And so this sand was well known as a hazard to many, many ships and many, many uh, situations. And basically, if you ended up in it, a lot of times you were not gonna get out. And so that was an interesting thing. When we think about sand, we think about uh, biblical examples of sand, but we could could do a lot in the Old Testament um, as far as, you know, numbers and things like that. But when we think of just New Testament examples of sand, what we, what, what's one of the first things we think about as far as sand? Foolish, Foolish man, right? In my line of work, I deal a lot with foundations. And so the foolish man, you know, building the house upon the sand, um, perhaps in a situation that would not be a very stable place to be was not a wise choice. Now, nowadays they have different construction methods and things they can do in sandy areas to reinforce those. But yet, it's interesting when you think about sand and the hazard of sand, that foundation, even in this situation, they were weary of it because it was not firm enough for them to maybe uh, get across or be an island, but yet it was scary enough that it was going to get stuck there as a boat. So it's it's an interesting kind of thought there. Um, the, the end of that section says um, another passage, another, another description. Again, there's a lot of descriptions in this, and you might get tired of these, but yet it's, it's written in there kind of for our understanding. If you put yourself in that position, verse 18, because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day we drew the ship's tackle, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. And then verse 20, it's a very interesting thought. Now, neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us. All hope we would be saved was finally given up. Talk about just utter desolation. Uh, Think about um, just 
all the hope was gone. You can't see the daylight for, for you know, for several days. They talk about. I've always thought about this. Uh, my older brother uh, was was on a sub in the Navy, and they'd go out for months at a time. And sometimes they'd be underwater for a long time. And for me, I couldn't do that because I have to be able to see the sun and see land. Uh, that's just my my preference. But yet, um, but yet, how? When you sit there and throw on the tempest, that's just wind, the waves, the danger of the sand, not being able to control the ship, and you have darkness. You have not necessarily darkness, but there's no sun, no stars. Basically, it's co- continual storms, continual clouds. It's just an interesting description to think about that. And then you think about all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. That's that's pretty sad. That's pretty uh, devastating to think about that. Not a whole lot of hope in that. Um, just interesting to think about just the, the gravity of uh, just that travel alone was, was dangerous. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of hope there. So verse 21 through 26, but after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be a, no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God, of whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore take heart, men, for I believe God, that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island." So here we see this first glimpse of hope given. We see this um, the situation that, that uh, remember, they're not really paying a lot of attention to Paul. They, they went on the trip anyway. He's just a prisoner. But he's, he's sitting there trying to give them encouragement. He's like, uh, you know, take heart. This is, you know, we're going to make this, we're going to make this work. We see verse 21, we see they've been on, uh, in this situation without, a long time without food or basically without eating. I believe, I believe they have food, but they're just not taking the time to eat. Perhaps they're in a situation where they're all active. Perhaps they're all uh, tied up or trying to keep everything from falling apart. Um, but we see that same, uh, see that same situation. We see that same reminder. Uh, you should have listened to me and not sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. Um, you know, if we, if we ended the chapter there, you know, you would sit there and say, they would still have no hope, right? If we would have stopped the verse in the chapter, ended there, be like, okay, why do we take the time to even sit there and read this? But they did have hope. And we see that the angel's words to Paul, to take heart, to keep up your courage, uh, that there would be no loss of life, only the loss of the ship. And Paul explains and verifies his source and faithfulness. He, he, is, he mentions an angel who appeared to him. And we see, we see a little teaching. We see a verification of where Paul is giving the credit. Okay? He's not saying, I think this, or it's going to happen because I said so. He said, angel appeared from God to whom I belong. Basically, whose I am. That's kind of the way it says it. Uh, to whom I serve. We have no doubt at all about that, but yet he is trying to verify his source to them. And so he says, do not be afraid. This is the angel, basically what the angel had told him. You must be brought before Caesar. God has granted you all, and all those on board safety. And to say, take heart. Because why? Because I believe God that it will be just as it was told. And then, it, then he gives information. We must run aground on a certain island. That doesn't sound very safe. You know, we're going to do this, and we're always safe, but we must run aground on a certain island. And so just an interesting uh, kind of thought there. But yet uh, through this, you know, Paul's initial thought, his initial concern was that there was going to be disaster and loss of life. And then we see a reassurance here that there would be disaster, but only of the ship. (coughs) And so that's a, that's a reassurance right there. That's something that uh, hopefully we can see, we can, uh, we can, we can be hopeful in, in that for Paul, but also we see the wisdom there, we see the faithfulness he had, that he had not given up on the situation. He had not given up on God.
verses 27 through 32. Now when the fourteenth night had come, as we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors sensed that they were drawing near some land. And they took soundings and found it to be twenty, 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little farther, they took soundings again and found it to be fifteen fathoms. Then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed day to come, prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape the ship, when they let down the skiff into the sea, under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, Paul said to the centurions and soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall. So here's an interesting transition. Remember Paul not having much influence, not having much say, just giving a warning. They decided to go ahead and make the travel, make the trip. And then you see a little transition here. We see the storm is still taking place. We see a timeline. This is the 14th night of the travel, 14th night of the storm, of, of, of going up and down in the sea. So still taking place here. It's like uh, kind of that dream that just won't stop. You know, it just keeps on going and going. Um, we see that they had sensed around midnight, of course it's dark already, we talked about it being dark still, but yet we talked, talk, they were sound, feel like, felt like they were getting close to land, so they took soundings, basically a way to measure the depth of where they were at. And this could, this could be done, of course it was at night, this could be done by lowering a weighted line or a chain, sometimes listening to things, listening for rocks and things like that. We see the depth, uh, it mentions 20 fathoms. Fathoms was uh, basically an old English word for meaning outstretched arms. So about meaning six feet each fathom. So the depth here, when it says 20 fathoms, is 120 feet deep. It takes, it takes more soundings than 15 fathoms. So it went from 120 to 90 feet. So they are getting closer to something. So they were getting in shallow. And then, so they, they didn't want to fear. They feared that they would... Uh, hit rocks and it tear apart the ships. They dropped anchor and they said they prayed for day to come. Um, it's interesting, you know, the sailors were seeking to escape the ship, which we read at the end of that passage. It says that they were acting like they were going to let down additional anchors basically to secure the ship, but basically they were basically lowering the skiff for the light boat, light boat to try to just get off the ship. They were worried. And also if they're close to land, they're thinking, hey, we can get to land to be safe. But what did Paul say? Unless these men stay in the boat, basically you cannot be saved. So then, like I said, we see that transition. We see the transition of they're not listening to him to now they're listening to him. It says the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall off. So we see this in verse 31, 32, we see the guidelines Paul laid out for their lives to be spared. Basically, unless you stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. We could... We could utilize that in a lot of different lessons. As far as you could use that as comparison to a life as a Christian, what person has to do to become a Christian. But we sit there, we see this is a great lesson about faith. Great lesson about faith. Paul's influence, as I mentioned earlier, the words not only impacted others, but they developed, they developed a trust about just by being around him. I, I believe that the examples basically that we're given um, you know, in the timeline, we're, you know, we skip over days and things, but yet I I'm, know I'm, oh, that what we, what we consider Paul doing when he was in the presence of the, the uh, Philippian jailer. What was he doing when he was in prison there? Praying and singing, right? He was uh, worshiping, he was in teaching others, and when the, the doors were open, no one escaped. His, his influence, his impact had helped others to at least believe his, his faith in God. And so you see this influence that has continued to spread. And it's, it's interesting that, that uh, it does impact in a very difficult time, in a very unusual time. But yet we see them cut those ropes and listen to him because they want to be, they want to survive. So when we think about faithfulness, we put ourselves in a situation, we put, think about being faithful. We see this example, it not only takes trust, it takes obedience. So it's a great parallel again with salvation in a spiritual sense. So.
we'll keep on going so we can finish up the chapter we might or might not get there. But verses 33 through 37. And as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day, and you have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment, for this is for your survival, since not a hair from, will fall from your head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. And they were all encouraged and also took food themselves. And in all, we were 276 persons on the ship. So when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat into the sea. So we see this, we see this information. Remember how it was dark for so many days? And what do we see in verse 33? As day was about to dawn, you know, when we see the light starting to come up, um, taking place, we see that, again, they hadn't been eating. Paul encouraged them to do so. Maybe they had given up all hope. Uh, maybe there, there's a lot of interesting things there, but yet um, Paul does this. He offers thanks. They follow his example, and they take on nourishment. And then they take the opportunity to lighten the load of the ship to get rid of more things. Earlier when they talked about lighting, lightening the load, um, they had lightened the load some, but they still had the main part of the cargo probably. They, they were probably going from one point to another, and that was you know, the main basically income probably of the ship was to take probably that wheat from one place to the other, and they had to get a lot of that out of there, basically to lift the ship up or let weight off the ship to keep it safer. We see, um, you know, there's a lot of different ideas there, but anyway, like I said, the USB sees about eating, uh, and Paul mentions this is for your survival, and he he reaff- reaffirms that they're going to be safe. He describes it as not a single hair will fall from your head. There will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. Like you know, looking back at verse 22, we see that word like safety, safety. We're going to be safe. And so it's just an interesting assurance that Paul gives them as, as they already have his attention and trust. Um, again, we see the number of people who are on the ship. Uh, so we see all this take place. Verses 39 through 44, as we kind of wrap up the chapter. When it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay with a beach onto which they planned to run the ship if possible. And they let uh, go the anchors and left them in the sea. Meanwhile, losing the rudder ropes, and they hoisted the main sail to the wind and made for shore. But striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the prow struck fast, stuck fast and remained immovable. The stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves. And the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion wanting to save Paul kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest, some on board and some on parts of the ship. And so it was, they all escaped safely to land. So what the angel had given Paul, what Paul's faith, what Paul had told them was truthfulness. It all came about. And it's interesting, as we talked about that centurion, that even the trust that Paul had built with them over the time, in this short amount of time of this travel, um, instead of perhaps killing um, all the prisoners so that they wouldn't have the fear of losing escaped prisoners, um, he wanted to keep them safe. So basically he ordered them, everybody who could swim to swim, swim to shore. And then you see those hanging on to pieces of the boat. We see what comes to pass is everybody is safe, but the boat is torn apart. And that was some of what was told was going to happen. So we see that fruition take place. We see that um, we talk about the prow, which is referred to as the bow, which is the frontmost part of the ship, um, basically, which is above the water line. We see it's stuck. We st- stuck in the ground, remained immovable. But I mean, the, the stern, the rear of the ship was being broken up by the waves. So, like I said, it was utterly destroyed. It was going to be destroyed other than parts and pieces that people were hanging on to to get to the land. Um, you know, we, we sit there and think about all this taking place. We see uh, this the continuation of Paul's faithfulness. We learned that this, you know, in chapter 28, verse 1, basically that this island that they landed it, that they got was called Malta, and we'll continue this more next week in chapter 28. But just looking at the map, you can see just the path that they had to take 
based on the time of year, based on the storms, based on uh, trying to uh, overcome shipwreck, overcome uh, dangerous, even though they still endured 14 plus days of tempestuous stormy winds. It was not a fun trap, not a fun trip. Um, it was a, a very dangerous situation. But in the end, Paul's faith did not waver. Paul's faith was firm. Paul's faith was true. And those that were around him, I think, started to have a greater faith in the God that, in Almighty God that Paul had served. And I think his teaching and, and his explanation went a long way to help basically assure them of that. And we see that, you know, even those of the 276 weren't all prisoners. They were everybody on the ship. So not even the crew, the captain of the crew, everybody was safe. So it's just an interesting lesson for us to think about. We see destruction, we see uh, danger, but we also see assurance and safety all in this chapter. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, again, think about just, we think about all the things that take place, all the nature things. We have to remember that, um, you know, God is in control of, of his creation. And we can appreciate that better a lot of times when we sit there and read and study a lot of things that people endure and had to, had to go through to get from point A to point B. So it also gives you a greater appreciation of the modes of transportation we have today. <laughs> um, at least it does for me. So any questions or comments? I know we kind of flew through there. Yes? This chapter helps us also realize it's a miracle too because nowadays there's a neighboring crash and there's a storm and there's a miracle no more thing get any damage. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, the, you could think about, like you mentioned the airplane crash. You mentioned about a plane crashing and everything, it being destroyed, but every single passenger being safe on board, basically, the situation. So um, that's like a great example of faith. Great example of faith. So. It is interesting to see how Paul's credibility <laughs> increases, and, you know, to not forget he is a prisoner, and then they just like, Everything he's saying is coming true. Let's listen to this guy. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just going to say this. Matt gives a lot of explanation, I think, to, to what's going on here. Yeah. The, the legend down here shows 300 miles. If you Google Rome to Malta, it's showing 1,190 miles. Yeah. Which is a long time back in that day. Well, I did some research on that. I didn't mention it earlier. But for the total passage, the total of chapter 27, 28, it was estimated around 2,500 miles by ship. So not just a small run down the road. So 